Hi, my name is Armin Kiankui. I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon here at Adventist Health in St. Helena, Napa Valley, California. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Mark Gerdish and the CTSNet for this opportunity to provide this uh, presentation on my journey as an AFib surgeon. So my journey started as an undergraduate at UCLA. I then went to the University of Minnesota for medical school, and then followed that by going to general surgery at the University of Vermont. And then I did my cardiac training at the University of Virginia under the mentorship of Dr. Irving Crone and Dr. Gaurav Alawadi. And that's really first when I kind of started this relationship with Atric here. And I was, I was that fellow that with Dr. Gaurav Alawadi, uh, helped assist in the first kind of totally thoroscopic ablations, epicardial ablations for AFib. And I, I was that fellow that kept scrubbing, you know, each of these cases, every one of these cases. And after I was done there in a couple of years, I had, you know, several under my belt and just kind of being introduced to that was, was really important. And I'm sure nowadays, you know, fellows are going through programs where technology is changing quite a bit. And there's always some new case that a fellow is going to be part of. And it, it really was that kind of new case for me that opened up my eyes to, to atrial fibrillation. When I was done at the University of Virginia, I went to Cedar sinai where I completed a heart transplant, thoracic transplant, kind of MCS ECMO fellowship. And when I finished, or when I was there, I actually, I worked with Dr. Ali Konazad. And as many of you know, Dr. Konazad is the principal investigator for the DEEP trial, which is looking at the endo epi or hybrid approach for the treatment of atrial fibrillation using the totally thoroscopic approach. And so I continued to have some influencers on, in the AFib world and continued to work in that, in that area. Then when I finished at Cedars, I actually went into private practice in LA. And that's where as an attending, I really started my AFib practice. And I joined a great group with two uh, surgeons who were treating AFib kind of in the, in the open concomitant setting, but nothing minimally invasively. And to be honest, it wasn't really a big part of their practice. So I kind of took that part of our practice, kind of that niche, and I more or less became the AFib guy. And in order to become kind of more facile in different treatments in AFib, I went up to here, actually in St. Elena, and I worked with Dr. Dunnington, who kind of took me under his wing and showed me how to do the totally thoroscopic case. And then I went back down to LA and I continued to work on that and continued to develop my AFib practice. So after a couple of years in private practice, I had what I thought it was a pretty robust AFib practice. And I was recruited to the University of Southern California at Keck. And so I was doing mainly heart failure there, but continued to focus on my AFib practice. And at Huntington Hospital, which is a uh, USC um, partner hospital, I was then working on my AFib practice. And, and after three years at USC, actually Dr. Dunnington recruited me back up to St. Helena. And so here I am now uh, in the Napa Valley doing mainly AFib surgery. So what I mean by that is uh, if you look at our open versus BATS maze or the TT maze or the hybrid maze, you know, multiple months we'll do more hybrid maze surgery than we'll do open uh, cardiac surgery. So really I'm in my dream job where I get to focus on AFib, um, treat a lot of hybrid patients, a lot of standalone patients in addition to, you know, the rest of cardiothoracic surgery. So this talk is kind of about how do you make a successful transition from a cardiothoracic trainee to a CT surgeon? So some basic career advice, and then how can you use AFib to help with that transition? Uh, for those of you who uh, are familiar with the TRSA podcast, uh, this, a lot of the content here was also recorded uh, back on September 18th in the 2019 kind of cardiac AFib ablation podcast. So really, you know, when I'm talking to trainees, talking to early attendings, it's really the keys to success are kind of these three A's. And first one being affable, and I think the most important, we just have to be nice. We have to be nice to our referrers. We have to be nice to our staff. You really can't be a jerk anymore. 
um, that just doesn't work, you know, in, in this culture that, that we have today, you know, being affable goes a long way. Then need to be available. And the, nowadays it's a lot easier than it used to be. Everybody has a cell phone you know, you can text, you know, make sure that cell phone number is available to all your referring docs. And even when you're on vacation, even when it's the weekend, you know, pick up the phone, just tell them, hey, you know, I'm on vacation, happy to take your call. Can I follow up on this later when I get back to the office? Um, just being available will make a huge difference in your practice. And then finally, ability. And, you know, if you're the world's best surgeon, but you're not nice and you're not available, nobody's gonna know how great you are. Nobody's gonna know, you know how good your results are. So be affable, be available, and then your ability will speak for itself. So it's interesting, you know, as, as we talk to more and more fellows around the country, as we're trying to educate about AFib, I always kind of pose these questions, you know, when they're in training, when you're in training, um, you always think about, okay, well, when I finish my training, will I be able to do a cabbage? And most trainees say yes. How about a surgical AVR? Probably less, but still, you know, a lot of trainees will be able to finish uh, completing a surgical AVR. Of course, a TAVR nowadays, mitral valve replacement, mitral valve repair to a certain extent. You know, I know a lot of trainees don't get actual leaflet work. <clears throat> Aortic is becoming a bigger and bigger part of the practice with TVAR and then transplant MCS, I still think is a fellowship kind of subspecialty training, but there is some introduction to this. But what's really interesting is when you start talking to trainees about atrial fibrillation, very few can actually do even a concomitant left atrial appendage management, whether that's with the clip or whether that's over, uh, over sewing it. <clears throat> Less have even seen standalone left atrial appendage management or even the convergent hybrid procedure um, and even in the concomitant setting. So most, most trainees cannot do pulmonary vein isolation on their own, let alone a full biatrial cox maze four. And even fewer can do a totally thoracoscopic maze, which is what our specialty is here at St. Elena. And so the reason I bring this up is because we, we know this, this problem exists. We know even according to the guidelines or, or the requirements or the ABTS requirements that says that you need five arrhythmia surgeries, we know that's not enough. And so we realize that trainees are coming out not being proficiently trained in arrhythmia surgery. And Dr. Dottie and, and his colleagues at the University of, of Utah um, actually did a study where they looked at how trainees felt about their arrhythmia training. And so you can see here, when you look at pulmonary vein isolation on a scale of zero to five, it was about a three and a half. When you looked at the cox maze four, it was only about a two out of five, cox maze three, one out of five, and their overall satisfaction with training was about a three. So the median ablations in, in this resident cohort was only five which is just what the ABTS requirements speak to. So again, we know that trainees are not getting enough training in arrhythmia surgery. And actually the, the AATS guidelines support this idea that when people finish training and they're out as attendings, that they should seek proctorship um, for their first three to five cases uh, in order to be more proficient at performing concomitant ablation. So as a new surgeon, you know, when you're out and you're looking for a job, whether it's in the academic setting or the private setting, you really want to provide a growth opportunity for that practice. And so in order to build a program, you one, need to identify an unmet need. Two, you need to be willing to educate your referring MDs, your C-suite, your nursing staff, your community about this new service that you're offering about this kind of gap that you're filling. And then even as important nowadays is that this new program that you're providing has to have some fiscal feasibility for either your practice or for the hospital. And so when I think about those three things, I think about AFib surgery. Now there are some other areas, you know, endovascular, which is, you know, structural heart or aortic, you know, in the T-bar or TAVR space, I think those fit that. Advanced heart failure obviously is growing. 
But when you talk about the ease at with which you can educate people, the fiscal feasibility, um, and the unmet need in a big way, AFIP surgery really meets all three of those. And I think for a, a new attending coming out, a junior partner, um, being able to get in and create this niche and provide this service in AFib, it's just so set up for you. We've known about AFib for a long time. All your referring docs know about AFib. They just need to know about the latest and greatest so that you can help your patients. So when I talk about the unmet need, what am I talking about? So Dr. Badwar and his colleagues at the STS um, showed us back in 2014 that we were doing okay. So when you looked at most mitral valve cabbage patients, about 68% of them were having their AFib treated um, in about a third of cabbage patients. But overall, we saw this trend. We saw this increase where from 2011 to 2014, we thought we were doing better and better. The problem is Dr. McCarthy and his colleagues at Northwestern came out with a, an additional study looking at Medicare beneficiaries, so an older patient group, and he showed that only 38% of mitral valve patients were having surgical ablation with a preoperative diagnosis of AFib. So when we thought we were at probably about 68% in the total STS database, it was only about 38% in the Medicare beneficiaries. And when you looked at non-mitral valve surgical patients with a preoperative diagnosis of AFib, only 16% of those patients were having their AFib treated. So again, unmet need for sure, even if you just do what the guidelines are telling you, you can develop an AFib practice. And so other regional groups have looked at this too. So the Northern New England Cardiovascular Disease Study Group has shown that yes, overall the trend is improving from about 16% in 2008 to about 27, 28% in 2015. Yes, it's getting better, but still you're looking at over two thirds of patients are still not getting their AFib treated in the concomitant setting. And Dr. Mahaffey and his colleagues through the University of Virginia and the VCSQI and, and the Michigan group also with Dr. Alawadi have shown that <clears throat> even though our diagnosis <clears throat> of AFib continues to increase about 40% of patients, uh, there still is a decreased rate of, of um, ablation. So we're only looking at maybe about 60% in Virginia and Michigan. So it really doesn't matter where you are in the nation, um, AFib is being severely undertreated. And Dr. Mahaffey and his group talked about, okay, so what are some of these barriers? So people talk about additional cross clamp time and my patients being too high risk as kind of these two main barriers to the treatment of AFib. So let's get into that a little bit. So for anybody who thinks that at any point in their career, they're going to be doing multi-component cases, whether it's AVR cabbage, cabbage mitral, mitral tricuspid, you name it, any kind of multi-component case, I really want to encourage people to start thinking about a primary component as atrial fibrillation. Remember, AFib treatment in the concomitant setting is a class 1A indication. It's just like anything else that we do, you know, severe AI and coronary disease, symptomatic severe MR and coronary disease. You would never not treat the valve. You would never not treat the coronary disease. And we need to start thinking about AFib in the same way. As you develop your multi-component cases, I know a lot of people are worried about cardioplegia. This is a wonderful article I just want to reference for everybody this is Dr. Allen, who um, wrote this great article in the European Journal of Cardiothoracic Surgery that was published in 2019. And it goes over all the different kind of reasonings and logic and science behind cardioplegia. And, and for the kind of the fresh attendings or the junior attendings, if you're ever worried about your kind of cardioplegia strategy in these multi-component cases, this is a, a wonderful reference article. So I I, um, I uh, propose that to you. And so the important thing is when you're, when you're doing AFib surgery, just like when you incorporate anything else into your practice, be smart about it. So what I mean by that is, you know, when you, we first start, you want to come out and you're swinging for home runs, but I really think that we should just be starting with base hits. 
And so maybe kind of your single, your, your, first, uh, your first base hit should be managing the left atrial appendage in someone with AFib. We know this has significant um, effect as far as improving outcomes. And so those, those first few cases where you have a patient who has atrial fibrillation, consider managing the left atrial appendage. Add that to your cabbage. Add that to your aortic valve replacement. Once you get a few of those under your belt, four or five of those under your belt, then maybe consider pulmonary vein isolation. And you know, you're getting around your sinuses, you're getting around your transverse and your oblique sinuses, you're getting that clamp around, you're providing that nice um, circumferential ablation around the left PBI and the right PBI. So maybe that'll be kind of your, your double equivalent. And then once you figure that out, so you're doing clip and PBI on someone maybe with paroxysmal AFib, then you can move into the, what, you know, the left-sided maze, which would just be doing the left-sided lesions. And I think one place where people often get hung up is the uh, mitral isthmus line and the coronary sinus lesions. You know, maybe omit those when you're first doing your left-sided. Just create a really good box. So now you've done clip, PBI, a roof lesion, a floor lesion. You've really created a nice uh, left-sided maze, if you will, although it's not a maze. Um, but it is very kind of, it's good surgical ablation. And then as you, you know, are able to orchestrate this multi-component case, then consider adding right-sided lesions. And we know there's a difference. We know there's a difference between adding the right-sided lesions or omitting them. It's probably about a 10 to 15% difference in overall outcomes. Um, but it's, I think it's important to continue to progress and to add on additional lesions. So then you could add the right-sided lesions. Ultimately, you can do the complete maze, and that's kind of your home run, is the biatrial lesion set, um, not omitting any of the lesions, managing the left atrial appendage, and that will give us the best shot of reducing AFib burden in these patients. The other thing I want to mention is with the convergent procedure, which is the new FDA-approved procedure, of epicardial endocardial teamwork, that could be a really nice way to start um, your introduction to AFib2. EPs are actually asking for this procedure more and more, which is, which is a really interesting position to be in um, because oftentimes as surgeons, we're approaching EPs to see how we can help in the management of AFib. And now there's, a, there's an opportunity where EPs are actually approaching surgeons with the convergent procedure. So I think that can be a, a an awesome kind of gateway uh, into AFib treatment as well. The other thing is, I think it's important to acknowledge that the AFib patient is different than our coronary patients and our valve patients. These are patients that, um, you know, classically we haven't followed, but I think moving forward, follow-up for the AFib patient is extremely important. This is a, a disease that like hypertension or something else is difficult to cure but we can manage it very effectively. And so I know here in our, our group here, we follow our patients at two weeks, uh, three months, um, and then every year after. And so, uh, you know, it can make for a busy clinic, but it's super important that, that we're following these patients to see that they maintain their restoration of normal sinus rhythm. And if they haven't, then we can get them back in the loop. We can get them to an EP for an endocardial touch-up. We can, we can uh, you know, see what their echo function is like. We know these are patients that we have to see on a more regular basis than um, we would otherwise for other cardiac patients. And once you get to the point where you are hitting home runs, and these are the results that you can expect, and these are the results that you can speak to your, your patients about. So, you know, three years um, on and off antiarrhythmics, about 75% of your patients will still be in normal sinus rhythm, about 65% off antiarrhythmics. So most of your patients will still be uh, without atrial fibrillation um, with a full Cox Maze 4. And this is Dr. Damiano's data at Washington University, where you can see his long-term follow-up, so 10 years. So you're looking at freedom from atrial tachycardias at about 77%, um, and freedom from atrial tachycardias and antiarrhythmic drugs at about 61%. So again, most of your patients, even 10 years out, are uh, without atrial tachycardias, and most 
uh, do not require antiarrhythmic medications. This is Dr. Navad's data. So again, what's, what's really interesting about his data is he shows, number one, that surgeon um, experience is a factor when you're ablating patients. So the more experienced you are, the more ablations you're doing, uh, the better overall your patients will do. And what's really interesting is he also looks at uh, burden reduction. And so he shows in this graph, you can see here, out to seven years out, you can still get significant burden reduction, even though, you know, uh, only about 70% of your patients will be in continuous sinus rhythm, which is still a, a huge deal. Um, about 90% of those will have significantly less burden, so less than one hour of AFib. And if you're talking to any patients about AFib, if you tell them, hey, seven years out, you may have a little AFib here and there, but overall less than an hour, that's a big deal to them. Those patients are going to feel a lot better. So the other thing that, you know, surgeons are often concerned about is they say, okay, well, I'm getting referred to this patient with atrial fibrillation, and their atria is really big. And Navad did a really nice study where he looked at, you know, what is the average size of the atria that we're treating? And if you look at his graph here, you can see on the bell curve, basically about five and a half centimeters. So when we're referred to a patient who has a five and a half, six centimeter atrium, that's totally within our ability to treat these patients. If you look at Navad's data, you're looking at, you know, 70, 80% success rate at one and two years um, in these patients. So when we're referred patients with what we think are these larger size atria, that is just kind of the norm for these patients. And we should not be afraid of, of treating these patients. Now, when you're talking about patients with nine centimeter, 10 centimeter atriums, you know, then that's probably kind of, you know, out on the, on the edge of these, of the patients that you're going to be able to treat successfully, but really in that five and a half to six centimeter uh, atria side, we really shouldn't be flinching at all. These are patients that we should be treating. And then there's also this concern about, okay, well, you know, they have a big atrium and they have had AFib for a long time. And again, Navad has shown us that, you know, even patients who've had AFib for greater than five years, you know, we can still treat these patients really well. Yes, there'll be a significant, you know, small but significant difference in our ability to, to restore normal sinus rhythm in these patients. But overall, I think any of us would take a success rate of 80% in somebody who's been in AFib for more than five years and has a left atrium that's bigger than five and a half centimeters. So again, this is the population that we see as surgeons and that we should be, feel comfortable treating. And then when it comes to high risk patients, you know, there's this concern, oh, my patients are too high risk. Well, Navad has also shown us in, in his data that if you break down patients based on Euroscore greater than six, that cumulative survival is no different in those patients that were considered high risk with or without surgical ablation. And so obviously, like I was talking about earlier, you know, you have to approach these patients with a certain amount of, um, with experience and being smart about them. You know, you don't want your very first patient to be, you know, a very high risk patients with depressed EF, a multi-component case, but ultimately as you increase your experience with this patient population, um, you can treat high-risk patients. And he also showed in, a, you know, looking at it in a different way, not just Euroscore of, above and below six, but low, intermediate, and high-risk patients, you can still achieve normal sinus rhythm, um, and you can still get them in normal sinus rhythm off antiarrhythmics. So one thing I just mentioned that, you know, we should talk about some more is what about atrial fibrillation in the heart failure population? You know, we have early data from the catheter world uh, looking at either Chimera MRI or Castle AF where, you know, our colleagues in EP have shown that if you do a successful endocardial catheter ablation for AFib, that you can reduce AFib burden and subsequently improve overall ejection fraction and clinical parameters. And this is the Castle AF study, which was a randomized study, which again showed that you could reduce AF burden in patients with heart failure. But even more importantly, we have our own surgical data. So this is uh, data out of Germany looking at concomitant surgical ablation in patients with AF with severely reduced LVEF. And so they looked at patients who had an LBVF of 
uh, on average about 30% preoperatively. And what's really interesting about uh, this study out of Germany is they showed that the overall EF improvement was from 28 to 39%. But if you got patients who were in sinus rhythm, they went from 28 to 44% versus those who continued in AF only went up about 5%, which makes sense because there is going to be some improvement because of the other component of their concomitant case. But if they got an ablation, in addition to that, their EF improved significantly more. In addition to that, more patients who were in normal sinus rhythm after their concomitant ablation had better New York Heart Association classification of heart failure. So more patients in sinus rhythm at one year were in class one or class two and, and uh, much fewer in class three and class four. So again, we have our own surgical data that shows that we can provide concomitant ablation and heart failure patients. Dr. Damiano actually looked at standalone AFib as well. And so this was in tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. And he recently published a paper showing that if you perform a Cox maze four in these patients, and so these were 27 patients with an EF of 40% or less with 22 month mean follow-up, you saw a significant improvement from preoperative to postoperative. So again, not in just in the concomitant setting, but standalone patients can be treated with a Cox maze four. And again, you saw the same trend where you see an improvement in uh, New York Heart Association uh, classification as well, where patients transitioned more into that class one class or the class one uh, New York heart failure um, from mainly class two. We recently submitted our data here from St. Elena to the STSA. And again, so we've looked at this same idea of tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy, and we've looked at um, how a hybrid maze or a hybrid approach can help these patients. And again, we showed that in these reduced EF patients, if you provide uh, surgical ablation, you can not only improve their LVEF, uh, but you can also uh, improve their left atrial uh, dimension. So again, even in these heart failure patients, surgical ablation can be safe and effective. Now, we all know what's going on in the aortic valve world. We know that... Um, low-risk transcatheter aortic valves are now approved. But it's, I think it's important to keep in mind that in many of these AS patients, you know, first of all, the average age of partner three was 73. And many of these patients have diastolic dysfunction. And so what's going on is these patients are getting their aortic stenosis treated. Many of these patients have preoperative AF that's now going untreated. <clears throat> And we know that the more severe your left ventricular hypertrophy is, the higher the chances of you having uh, atrial fibrillation up to almost about 50% in patients that have very hypertrophied ventricles. And we know that patients who are in um, atrial fibrillation don't do as well, and they don't do as well as far as remodeling, ejection fraction. And so it's important that in these patients, that if they're undergoing transcatheter aortic valve replacements and they have preoperative atrial fibrillation, that we treat them. And again, this is another area of the population that is ripe to build a practice on. More and more patients are getting TAVR. Uh, significant numbers of these patients have AFib. And again, this is even in the structural heart world, an opportunity for us to, to grow our programs. So overall, what I think is going to happen is you have patients who undergo TAVR who now have this kind of pseudo-isolated or pseudo-lone AF. And I think this is a growing and growing kind of non-sternotomy population. And if you can offer a non-sternotomy ablation, whether it's convergent or VATS maze, again, I think this is an area where you can build your program. And so I just want to touch on the hybrid data. So this is um, the recent uh, FDA approved randomized control study data that uh, came out. And so this is using the hybrid approach, which again is the surgeon provides an epicardial ablation and the uh, electrophysiologist provides a second stage endocardial ablation. And you can see their excellent outcomes. And so these are patients that are one year and 18 months out have reduced AF burden, restoration of normal sinus rhythm and improved quality of life. So again, this is brand new data kind of hot off the press. 
Um, and we can use the, these data in conversations with our EPs, with our structural hard docs, again, to continue to build our AF programs. And as we kind of have these conversations, I think historically we used to talk about uh, kind of this 100% cure or failure for AFib. And it was about failed ablations or failed mazes. And nowadays, I think a more kind of contemporary conversation is a heart team approach. You know, more and more surgeons and EPs are working together where they have a shared lesion set. They feel this kind of shared responsibility for the patient and the patient management, especially when it comes to left atrial appendage management. Um, and that you know, is, is another huge kind of data point that's come out. So Dr. Whitlock and his colleagues just published, you know, May 15, 2021, New England Journal of Medicine randomized control study looking at left atrial appendage occlusion during cardiac surgery to prevent stroke. And so for those who are not familiar with this study, these were patients that had atrial fibrillation going into the operating room and they were randomized to have their appendage occluded or not multi-center trial, CHAS vast greater than two. Uh, most patients had usual care, including oral anticoagulation after their, their surgery, and the primary outcome was ischemic stroke. And so about 2,400 patients in each group, the average CHAS vast was four, and they had excellent follow-up, 30 days every six months for an average of about four years and about 75% were on oral anticoagulation. And what we saw, what we learned from this randomized control study is indeed, yes, if you manage the left atrial appendage at the time of your open cardiac surgery, your patients will have a less incidence of stroke. And so in this study, it was the no occlusion group, 7%, the occlusion group, 4.8%. So a significant difference when managing the left atrial appendage at the time of cardiac surgery with a preoperative diagnosis of AFib has now been shown in a randomized control study to improve the incidence of postoperative stroke. They also go on to show us that the amount of time required to do this was very little. Uh, this was about five minutes or four minute difference between the two groups and the number needed to treat was 37 occlusions to prevent one stroke every five years, which for kind of any of us in the AFib cardiac surgical um, uh, groups, you know, that's, that's not very many patients at all. So that's an excellent number needed to treat. Um, <clears throat> and there was a huge uh, difference uh, between the, the two groups after the first 30 days. And again, just to remind folks, so, you know, when we look at, pay, you know, surgeons who are treating the left atrial appendage at the time of surgery with the preoperative diagnosis of AFib, unfortunately, even in our STS data, it's only about 37%. So there's a lot of potential to improve our management of the left atrial appendage. We have data from the STS that shows that there's an overall improvement in all-cause mortality and thromboembolism, as well as composite score. So we need to be managed in the left atrial appendage, and we can do a lot better job with that. And again, this is an opportunity to improve your practice and to, to build on your AFib practice. You know, I've, I've provided a lot of data here in this talk, you know, when I, for the trainees and the new attendings out there. You know, I think one real nice way to stay up to date on your, on your data is to use the My NCBI option at PubMed.gov. So this is an opportunity for folks to uh, create a, uh, a keyword email search. So PubMed will send you emails every day with uh, whatever keyword you provide. So I provide the atrial fibrillation keyword. Uh, every morning I get a series of of uh, short abstracts from PubMed, and that just keeps me up to date. So I know as soon as that Whitlock paper kind of came out, I knew as soon as um, uh, Mahaffey's paper came out. I mean, it's really nice just really quickly in the morning to go over that email, see what papers have come out, and then you can save whatever you need to to your collections. And then you can use that for talks like this in the future, any papers you're writing. Um, it's a really nice way to kind of keep up to date without um, having to go in and search for articles yourself. 
So as you kind of have all this information and you start having these conversations, it's all about building relationships with your cardiologists, your EPs, your family practice docs. And I'll just kind of share a story with you. You know, when I first got into practice as a, you know, a young surgeon, I was, you know, looking for, looking, looking for cases, meeting folks. And I remember one of my very first interactions with the cardiologist, we were sitting at kind of two separate kiosks and he was looking over an angiogram and I kind of poked my head over and I was just saying, you know, what are you looking at? What, what you know, what's that angio show? And we kind of kept going back and forth and he said, yeah, you know, this patient has coronary disease, they have AFib. And I said, oh, okay, do you, do you like it when your surgeons treat the appendage? And he said, oh yeah, of course, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna prevent a lot of strokes if you treat the appendage. And it was really interesting because just kind of having that conversation, showing that interest in managing the left atrial appendage, he became one of my early referring docs. And then I kind of became the AFib person. And over time for that group, I was their AFib surgeon and that kind of spread. And that was when I was a, a surgeon early on in Los Angeles. And all it takes is a conversation like that. All it takes is mentioning your interest in AFib management, because again, most surgeons are not interested in treating it. And so that can really provide a, a, a diving board for your, for your career. When you're getting out to new practices, you know, offer the opportunity to provide a grand rounds, do doc talks, peer to peers, lunch and learns, you know, direct patient marketing with seminars is very effective. And, and you'll see as you kind of bring in more and more AFib patients that there will be a halo effect. There will be built-in referrals. will appear about probably about 20% of our patients who are directly referred for AFib treatment um, go on to have some sort of concomitant surgery. So whether that's valve or cabbage or something like that. The last thing I wanted to mention is there is, I think, this component of fiscal responsibility that we need to be aware of. I just want to put this out there. So um, CPT codes, if you're looking at concomitant ablation, so again, this is our professional reimbursement. You're looking at probably about $900 on average Medicare. Standalone surgical maze, it's probably about $2,000. Endoscopic, again, about $2,000. I only put that out there so you can have some sort of reference to what you're doing already. So again, mitral repair is about 2,500, aortic valves about 2,400. So again, in comparison to most coronary work you're doing, an endoscopic or standalone surgical maze is about the same. Again, this is kind of average Medicare reimbursement. So just, just to show you that it is fiscally responsible to, uh, to be performing these surgeries. And again, on the hospital side, Again, a concomitant surgical ablation for the hospital typically reimburses at a higher rate than just the cabbage alone. Um, not as great as aortic and mitral valves, but pretty darn close. So again, uh, you know, cardiac surgical ablation is, is, I think, a fiscally responsible addition to any practice. The wonderful thing about all of this, though, is that some of these, uh, the patients are your most grateful. So when you get them in normal sinus rhythm, when you can get them off anticoagulation, these are some of the most satisfied patients that you'll have. Uh, they'll be willing to promote you. I receive texts on a regular basis from my patients just kind of thanking me, I get cards during the holidays from these patients. So, you know, these are honestly some of the most satisfied patients that, that you will have. And finally, you know, um, we've all chosen to take on this very kind of humbling profession. We know complications will happen. Um, it's important that you communicate with your referring docs and family members when complications happen. Um, take the long view on your career, you know, set out on something that you're passionate about and just keep working at it. And earn your Saturdays. You know, I think it's, it's okay to work really hard Monday through Friday, and then you get your breather on Saturdays and Sundays. So one of my, uh, one of my residents early on told me when I was an intern, he said, Armin, wake up every morning, have a piece of humble pie, and then come to work. And I, I try to keep that in mind still, because um, it is a great profession, but it can be, can be very humbling. So I'll just leave you with this last little uh, note here. 
It's called One in a Row. It's from the book Green Lights by Matthew McConaughey. So it says, any success takes one in a row. Do one thing well, then another. Once, then once more, over and over until the end. Then it's one in a row again. And I think that's a really nice kind of way to capture how we need to approach surgery, how we need to approach incorporating new things into our practice, especially things like atrial fibrillation. Once you do it well, you'll want to do it again. You want to do it more and more. And ultimately, um, it'll be a successful part of your practice. So again, I'm Armin Kionkui. Thank you for your time. And thank you, Dr. Gerdish and the CTSNet for this opportunity. Um, here is my personal email and cell phone number. Uh, here at St. Elena, we are an AATS Dr. James Cox Fellowship site for atrial fibrillation training. So if anybody's ever interested, they can reach out. Okay, thank you so much.